Hello everyone, I'm Ashley. Welcome to Tea Table Talk. I'm delighted to be here with Anna Brown today. Hi Anna. Hello, nice Hi. to be here. Delighted to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining us for Wild Acres Week, which for anyone who doesn't know is a week long uh, series of events which has started, we're halfway through now with talks, workshops and then a couple of these wonderful Tea Table Talks. Um, so I'm delighted, uh, Anna, to have you here. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to finding out a little bit more about um, what you do um, and then how you're involved with Green Sod's Ambassador Programme and all the wonderful things you're doing. I saw a lovely interview video with um, you on RTE. And one of the things that really caught me is that you've been growing flowers ever since you were a teenager. Yes, um, indeed. Yeah, so I'm kind of really curious about, you know, um, it's so important for children to engage in nature and then for us to sort of have that passion. So how, how has your journey been from growing as a teenager to going into sustainable? So I grew up on a farm um, in the 70s um, here in Mullingar and there wasn't, we didn't have a television, there wasn't a lot, lot to do. So um, seed catalogues are one of my entertainments they were free you could look at the seeds all winter and then buy a few and grow flowers um and I just I just love the beauty of it you know the 70s was kind of a bit of a drab time um you know from a lot of points of view I mean, maybe you had orange carpets and whatever but you know did, the flowers certainly gave my, my life great color I ended up then working um as a computer scientist for a long time but no matter where I went in the world I always grew something and I suppose that that original background, and I mean, we we were we weren't subsistence farmers exactly, but we did grow a lot of our own um, fruit, our veg, and uh, you know we had a freezer full of animals that we had raised ourselves. So we had a very healthy lifestyle and um, a very delicious lifestyle as well. And I suppose my part of that was the flowers. Um, you know, they, there wasn't huge value placed on flowers by the farmers, and I think that that flower bed soon um, got built over after I left, but. What's interesting now is that as a flower farmer, um, from the point of view of return on investment, you can actually make a lot more money as a farmer with a small piece of land than you could growing vegetables. because People will pay more for flowers mm -hmm. than they will for veg, which is an interesting turnabout. So yes. I, I talked to my cousins who are sheep farmers about this and, and, and they kind of can't believe how much people will pay for something that grows in a very small amount of space. And also you get um, multiple crops on the one piece of land, you know, your annuals, you can harvest multiple times or other things you can plant, you know, you have tulips in the spring and the same space can grow dahlias in the autumn. Mm -hmm. So you can actually use the land very efficiently. So it's it's a very efficient way to to, to get value from, mm -hmm. from your land. Um, but yeah, I, I've always loved growing. I've always loved plants. I, I, I can't not be around something like that um, yes. and, and stay sane, even though I've been in a very, very opposite kind of a career in the computer world um the plants always kind of kept me sane and anchored and I think that's a really important thing that you mentioned there that you know nature keeping us sane and I wonder if there is something in that in terms of the statistic of people buying flowers more than vegetables when we connect with things we we do it to our senses and I'm, I was just thinking there like when you see a flower you can instantly like you know there's a there's the emotions. A, there's an emotion straight away. Yeah. And then you the can smell, smell the it. sight. Yeah. And people I mean, give you flowers at emotional times. They give you flowers yes. when someone's born, when somebody dies, when someone gets married. You know, flowers are associated with that kind of emotion. So there's a lot going on with flowers from an emotional point of view. Um, and, you know, people will smell a sweet pea and remember their granny because she had those in her garden. And that smell, you know, it brings you back um, in a way that the, vision, the sight can't do. Yes, yes. Yeah, did you have a fa favorite flower when you were younger or um, now even? You know, there's a flower called English marigold or calendula and it's 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 really very much of a a goer. You know, it it can bloom year round outside if the weather is mild. You can use the petals to make a healing ointment. Um and it's just this very attractive yellow orange kind of flower. So it's not a native Irish one, but it just it's got guts, you know. <laughs> And it's got very interesting little seeds as well, like little alien babies. So um, wow. it's one of my favorites just because it grows so prolifically and it keeps on giving. You know, mm. I, I was just looking through my photographs and I saw a big bunch that I picked in January out of my polytunnel um, one year. So it's it's just a great, a great one. And, you know, it's a good one for pollinators as well. Um, they they mm. certainly do because it's it's got a nice open. I suppose the thing about 
if you grow flowers that have lots and lots of petals, you know, like the kind of the standard dahlias, the pom poms, the birds, the bees can't get at, and the butterflies can't get at the the nectar. Mm-hmm. You want an open flower, and certainly the calendula are quite open that you can you can the you know the bees can get at um what, what mm-hmm. they need to the pollen and the nectar there. That's so, it. Um, that's an interesting thing I hadn't t- you know from an artist's point of view even that idea of the shape and the form of something, I'm I find you really interesting. I, I wouldn't have. Yeah, when you say that, it makes complete sense, but you don't think about those sort of things when you pick up a, a plant or put plant something in your garden from even the way you describe the shape of the seed, you know, right through to how a flower opens that. Um, there's something wonderful I can only imagine when you're working on it you know, in your farm every day. And as you say, watching the different plants through the seasons, how there's all these other layers yeah, and to connect and plants, with nature. Plants that like self seed are tremendous because there's so much less work um, if, if they'll grow themselves, you know. So, and that's, that's one of the things that I think is really important for people to realize is that, you know, there's a certain amount of control you have to impose if you want to get, get a crop. Um, but if you pay attention to what nature is doing um, and see where the seeds are, you know, self seeding, this is where this plant likes to grow and it'll grow more. So, you know, work with it. Don't Don't be trying to do something else you know um certainly pay attention to what mother nature tells us because we have for so long we have tried to impose our will on nature and you know grow monocultures and monocrops and do what we think is right for the humans but you know that's going to result in the human race heading for extinction Mm. if we're not careful so to me it's, it's to listen to what mother nature is telling us and and pull with her because that makes our lives so much easier and it'll result in a much better result for all concerned all all the creatures on the the planet um if we do that so with with that i'm sort of visualizing my own uh, garden which you know in one way needs a lot of tending to this um are you saying then that when there's the self-seeding flowers that you just you allow that to happen and it, it won't overtake it anyway if you see weeds popping up do you, like do you dig do you is there management or you know there's always a balance between people including myself thinking how much is actually weeds that I should take away how many dandelions should I pick or leave how many of those you know I have a particular flower which I'm ashamed to say I I don't know the name of but it's a little it's not a bluebell but it has little blue flowers but it's it uh, pops out little black tiny little black gems beautiful shiny seeds but again I kind of wonder are they Will they take over? So where's the balance with? with well, I mean, that? so I, I'm a big proponent of no dig. So um, I, I I dig as little as possible. And one of the things that you you learn about no dig is you never leave soil uncovered because uncovered soil, you know, the soil is Mother Earth's skin, and she doesn't want to be naked. Fair enough. Um, so weeds will grow because they're the things that have their seeds in the soil. If we leave her naked, so don't. Um, mm-hmm. Cardboard bark mulch compost you can put those things down and i mean if, if you're if your compost is your own you might have some weed seeds in that but generally if you've done that the soil is very loose and it's very easy to get out the ones that you don't want to grow so those two things i think make for a much easier time of it for people and i i have um i, I live in a suburban housing estate and this the section between the footpath and the road is called the hell strip and that was grass and we had to mow it and it wasn't very good because there wasn't very much soil over the builder's rubble when we moved in so we put down some cardboard and we put down some bark mulch we planted into that and now it's it's really thriving it's um full of beautiful plants it's full of an apple tree um and you know it's something nice to walk past for people and what's interesting as well is that because it's a small strip and it's out from the house it's actually much hotter and drier so plants that like to be hot and dry which you know don't get that much in ireland grow really well there so you know if i'm planting it i make sure the plants i put in aren't ones that love moisture they're the ones that like to be you know hot and dry and they'll thrive so those kind of that kind of stuff to know and i have um at the back then i have the opposite i have a rain garden so we were we were noticing that we were getting a lot of water build up on our back path so we basically dug a a trench that holds that rain so we don't end up putting it into you know the 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 system so it's, it's not leaving our garden um, and the plants that love, you know, there's, there's some plants that there's a Circisium rivulare, which is the thistle that loves to be by the river. And it loves to grow there because its its roots are nice and moist there all the time, because mm-hmm. whenever it rains, you know, you basically other parts will dry out probably, you know, a good few, maybe a week sooner than this part because it's held on to the water for longer. So there's things that you can do that are very simple, that don't cost any money, that allow you to have lots of different ecosystems in your garden and have plants that you like. But just it's knowing which plants like what 
And quite often, if you look to see where that plant grew in nature when it was a weed, mm. you'll find out, or the, you know, the Latin name will tell you, you'll find out where it likes to grow. And, you know, there are no real weeds. Like, you know, everything that we grow was a weed somewhere. You know, it grows. I'm, I'm sure calendula is a weed in Greece where it comes from. Yes. Um, but, you know, I think people would really appreciate it. And, you know, if you if you drive past uh, banks full of rose bay willow herb, they're absolutely gorgeous, you know, and they're probably full of pollinators. So, you know, if 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 we have this notion that everything has to be tidy and green and square, Yes, of course, those are definitely weeds. But if, if we if we look at dandelions as being this incredible food plant, you know, for bees at the early stage and plenty of cultures think dandelions are really gorgeous with you know, the clocks that you yeah. blow. And actually, I've, I've heard of people buying seeds for dandelions in, in East Asia so they can grow them. So and there was a time, I think, in, in our in our growing culture where we didn't see dandelions. We saw them as a really good food yeah. plant. Um, so it, it's it's really a lot of that is social conditioning. And um you know, I think to look at those plants and say they're intrinsically bad is is not correct. Um, they're not intrinsically bad. They're just we have been conditioned to think, you know, flat green is good. Yellow thing sticking up in the middle of it is bad. But yeah. that's not biodiversity. That's a green desert. Yes, you know? 100 percent. So like and if I you think of your of your golf courses, like there's not much living. Um, there's not much being fed on a golf course unless mm. they have some wild areas. It's mostly just mown grass. And while it's green, it's yeah. certainly not a great habitat. But ironically, it's not nature, really. You know, nature no. doesn't isn't like that in any way, shape. No, it's an expression way. of wealth. It is. It is. Uh, but get like if you ask, I think ninety nine percent of people, I'm almost sure, if they drive past somewhere that has just this abundance of flowers popping up and colors and textures, that they their heart won't sing, or they won't want to just stop the car, or it won't affect them in some way. Whereas, how how much would that happen when you just drive past? Lord after lord well, after lord. It, it depends on how you've been conditioned you know there's i mean I, I know i'm an aberration in my housing estate um and i think now it's okay people are used to it but i think there was a time when i was starting that people got very nervous that i was going to bring down their property values and that you know here's this wild this wild garden that is not <laughs> properly mowed and stuff but you know now it's it's really beautiful so people yeah. would see it as something that they they would enjoy walking past certainly during um the early stages of covid lockdown it was a very you know it was spring it was sunny there was lots and lots of flowers people like you know give me a lot of positive comments about how how beautiful it was and i suppose the other thing is you know it doesn't look great most gardens don't look great kind of come september october if that's yeah. just part of and you you have to really push yourself to enjoy the beauty of, you know, sticky up branches that have hollow stems. They're actually going to be a really good home for bugs, but don't actually look that good until the frost comes and kind of silvers them. So there's a bit of a patience required to that. And it, that's the social conditioning. Again, you know, if we get people to, you know, P.P. Rudolph is a gardener that does a lot of perennial gardens and he's got people to appreciate grasses. Um, and I, I, I run jam jar arranging workshops for people and I bring in lots of wild grasses from the fields and I show them what colors they are and how they complement the flowers they have. And they're like, oh, I've got those growing at home. And like, yeah, you do. So, you know, let them grow and then use them in your arrangements. And um, it, it's just a matter of, of appreciating that, you know, it, it's, it's it, once again, it's just a different perspective gives you a more appreciation of what's going on. Yeah. You talk I think there, you bring up two things is that idea of time and spending time like you you have to spend time nurturing your garden growing your garden and that and through that that idea of really understanding nature so when you were thinking of where to put your plants you knew what would grow near the pond you know you've taken time to watch and see and and I think that's a big thing about the the theme that we have you know for wild acres say the de uh, deepening our connection with nature and it is time you mentioned you mentioned patience and also that idea that you know the gardens don't always look good and nature does have this um life and decay cycle every year and there is with that you know a, a changeover but there's a one as you said a wonderful beauty in that once you start to give time because you suddenly realize it's home to this little creature or it's protecting the seed in this way or you know and you start to see things that you don't see if you're not actually in, in our own lives we need to take time to rest we need to take mm. time when we're busy frantically doing things like now you know when there's lots of light and then come the winter we need to kind of hunker down and you know be still and and enjoy just our homes and the coziness of them so we we lost touch with those cycles um you know a green lawn is green all the time it's the same you know it just grows more in the summer but you know those cycles are actually really important and you know the the, the buds of growth coming in february and march that's really exciting 
Um, and it doesn't happen, you know, all the time. It only happens for a short period of time. So you can be excited and then know that won't happen again until next year. The same as eating local strawberries. Yes. Like they taste so good. So I, I have loads of raspberries right now and they, they taste amazing. Um, mm. I know I won't have them in a few months time. So I'm eating Enjoy. myself sick on them. Yes. <laughs> and, and then I know that I'll have a different fruit to eat at a different time. So, um, and we, we've lost that connection that tells us about, you know, what's in season. Um, and uh, I've, just a sort of funny aside I was doing a horticultural course and somebody had somebody was doing seasonal recipes and they had a recipe for cucumbers that was in I think March or April and the whole class was up in arms like these are not seasonal you can't possibly get cucumbers are seasonal at this time of the year and okay. we were writing I think it was on RTE so they were they were just really really upset about um, somebody you know giving misinformation so once once you know you know yes. and you really are, you know you're very tuned into that if you've grown you know you know what's in season and you know you can't um really have asparagus that's locally grown in December it has to come from a long way away so um and and but we can all actually we all have that knowledge in us somewhere because if our ancestors weren't good at growing things we wouldn't exist so we all have lots of horticultural knowledge in our genetics that we have just to tap into and I think people you know people fail because they, they try to impose their will on nature they try to do something that doesn't make sense um, and mm-hmm. then they think they failed and they're no good at it and they give up. But if they actually took a little bit of time to observe and see, you know, what does grow well and, you know, focus on that, then they could probably have a much more successful experience of working in nature. Yeah, I think that goes generally, doesn't it? That ebb and flow. If we work with things, things will fall into place much easier yeah. than if we push and pull. There's the, there's a struggle. And, and the biggest thing is just that it makes life definitely easier for us. If you go with nature, she she blossoms, she she's fruitful. Um, yes, there's some work, but it's it's no different to the, the work we have to put into everything else in our life. That, um, That's worth doing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and as you, you described there, exa- you know, your raspberries and knowing they're going to disappear but then what fruit's going to come next it kind of gets me like rhubarb season I get so excited for uh, you know <laughs> like rhubarb but my even myself my husband actually f- found a really good little ta- you know table that did the months and what vegetables were in so even when we were living in an apartment in Dublin we'd always refer to that if we were and you know and some of them you did know, you instinctively know that cucumbers aren't going to be a winter vegetable or, you know, but other ones, it got us to also learn and be observant. So by the time we came then to where we are now and had a garden, we had even just that little bit more understanding of what we can grow, what times of the years when they, you know, which then helps as well with, as you said, phasing your garden so that there's often things growing at different times. Yeah. And it challenges your cooking ability as well, because if you have a few set recipes that you make, you know, year round and you buy what, you know, you buy those things, no matter whether they're in the season or not, you have a very, I suppose it's not a very varied diet, but if you can actually adapt, you know, or think about what's the recipe now for February, what's the recipes that have the root vegetables for the winter and now the summer, what's the recipes of the tomatoes and you know, the basil and that kind of thing. So you have, you know, your, 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 your palate will, will benefit from it also yes. and your cooking repertoire will increase because it has to. Yeah. Definitely. Wonderful. Um, so just then in terms of, I'm going to change the subject slightly to um, you as a biodiversity, biodiversity ambassador. Um, so the Biodiversity Ambassador Programme, for anyone watching that doesn't know, is an initiative by Greenhouse Culture in association with Green Sod Ireland, which we launched last year. And Anna, you're um, one of our first ambassadors and it's been uh, you know it's just great to have have you and you've done a few talks and other things and I'm so excited to see your your flower farm we've seen some beautiful beautiful pictures but I'm curious um has has that in any way um informed what you do or support what you do it's affected my engagement with the community I think so with the community of bio of the ambassadors certainly you know when I have something that I have I'm trying to communicate or I'm trying to, I was doing a submission for the Westmeath County Council. I asked the ambassadors what, you know, what I should be submitting and they had some very good, good ideas. And it, you know, a lot of them are engaged more with um, communities in terms of what they're, you know, what they're doing. And it's kind of, you know, encouraged me to push into that way a little bit more is to try and do more community work. Um, no, I'm not there yet, but certainly it's, it's helping me see things in that way of what the benefits are of doing stuff like that. And even funding opportunities, you know, you might hear about them. So that's quite a good thing to know about because at the end of the day, we have to make a living. 
um we have to you know we've got a business so you can't just do everything for free um so knowing about what kind of funding is available can be quite useful yes yeah it's a lovely network actually and um what what i really like about the biodiversity ambassadors is how varied you all are like you bring an awful lot of action in terms of that thinking about locally grown flowers or um yeah that flowers don't only come from a shop that they that that they're they're in someone's garden and uh you know there as you said there's other people that would be very community focused or driving initiatives um but in terms then of your you know your your sustainable farm if we had to think about the the, the idea of the wild acres week and the biodiversity ambassador program to encourage sort of biodiversity action but in in this year we're really looking at that idea of developing a deeper connection with nature as well what what type of things do you do you think we could encourage other people to do particularly from you know where you're yeah. coming from well i mean the three things i ask people to, i i encourage people to do to have a more biodiverse garden be it where it's growing lots of flowers or whatever is to stop digging so do practice no dig so that's you know you're not disturbing all your invisible friends who do a lot of the work for you to stop using herbicides and pesticides and artificial fertilizer um, to use seaweed or natural you know compost instead farming manure and then um what's the final one <laughs> i had them off pat um this is not it but this is a very good one is to actually pay attention to sit and look and listen so if you have a garden that you know gets sunshine different times of the year so put put a camera up and see where the sun moves around to see what parts you know you're getting sun in um but you know all those things that you're doing with the feeding the soil is the other one is to keep the soil not being bare to use cardboard and so forth to suppress any weeds or any plants that you don't want to grow and then cover that with bark mulch or compost and plant into that um that's a really good way to not disturb all the ecosystems that are below the soil that we don't even know about very well but they're they're incredibly helpful for our plants to grow the second thing is to stop using um, pesticides and herbicides and artificial fertilizer because they kill all those organisms below the soil you know a pesticide will kill all treasures not just the ones that you don't want to be there so um, stop using those and these are all things that actually take less work than what you've been doing and less money so they're, they're worth doing mm -hmm. and then the final thing is to feed the soil and that's the part of no dig i suppose as well as to use organic material and all that organic material feeds the mycorrhizal fungi it feeds the worms the earthworms it feeds the tiger worms in your comp post it feeds the nematodes it feeds the bacteria and the fungi so it's definitely worth doing those things and you know you can feed it something as simple as not blowing your leaves you know just leave the leaves there and you know worms will come and take them and put them into the soil and make it all good for you um so there's lots of things you can do that don't require you to do much work but they're actually worth doing in the long term um the work i suppose is maybe internal work that you have to do to get over your need to have things be tidy mm, yeah so, yeah it's interesting you say the the internal work because I think there is a lot of internal work when you work with nature even just the eyes opening and as you said noticing and understanding those even what you said there like this is what we have to do to to make sure nothing grows in these particular areas but this is then what I need to do in terms of not poisoning the the, the soil in other areas and then um and it goes back to the cycle even just those three steps to me thinks of you know how how nature will grow and you're, you're getting it to that point um, and the soil is an incredibly um you know powerful and and scarce resource so the more we can do to build soil in our suburban gardens or out in fields or whatever the better you know we're, we're, we're you know that's mother nature's skin and we want to leave it nice and healthy so that she doesn't get any bad things happening to her so you know we're, we're losing soil at a tremendous rate from um, you know, large scale agriculture that's using artificial chemicals and is digging every year. It's just blowing away. We saw that in the Dust Bowl in the States back in the 30s and 40s. And that's going to happen. At, you know, we're just losing it into the into the seas, into the rivers, which isn't good for the rivers either. So if we can hang on to that soil and, you know, make it more fertile, let, let's do that, even at a small scale. Mm -hmm. I do love your um your description at the beginning of our, our chat here and then at the end of Mother Nature's Skin. And I think that's a lovely way to to visualize it, that it's not just this soil and we're not just planting the seeds. In it's there, not you, dirt. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we have this word for it. It's like, it's not a nice word. It's, you know, dirty. Oh, that's not nice. But actually it's, it's this teeming with life thing that supports, we wouldn't exist. You know, Darwin, he wrote a book about earthworms and he thought they were really important creatures that had a huge effect on the history of, of, of mankind. And he was right. 
yeah. you know they they actually build soil when, when you when you excavate places that have been left to go you know archaeologists what they're excavating out is all the worm stuff that came on top of what the humans built yes yeah so the so the so the moral of this chat is to get out get dirty <laughs> yeah get your fingers in the soil and spend time that's the one thing i'm pay really attention. going to take yeah, yeah pay, pay attention. attention like look and you know appreciate and don't be running around like a crazy thing trying to kill all your dandelions just you know appreciate the things that are visiting them um and then if you need to kill a few put down some cardboard over them and cover it with mulch and then plant into it and I mean yeah. some of them will grow again and you can but you can get them out a lot easier if you've done the whole mulching and no digging if dandelions are doing stuff because the soil has issues you know they're 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 if the soil's compact the dandelions put down these roots that help to aerate it like they're actually doing useful yeah. things um and you know while I let the dandelions go to seed here I don't actually have a huge amount of dandelions because other plants you know are covering the soils so the dandelions can't get a purchase yeah likewise actually we have dandelions and we have a few they're not they don't multiply every year and I've actually been experimenting trying to make dandelion syrup and you know mm -hmm. trying to have them in salads so you know they can be playful and fun and absolutely and great yeah well Anna thank you so much for joining me today on Tea Table it's been great chatting with you I hope we can do this again can we give people a few takeaways about the um about farmers so I suppose we've talked a lot about um biodiversity in your garden but the other thing the other aspect of that is people who are trying to make a living and also not destroying um the ecosystems around them regenerative farmers organic farmers including flower farmers and if we don't support them if we don't buy locally produced vegetables if we don't buy locally grown flowers they won't survive because they have to make a living and you know we i think it would be terrible to see us go to um to this big monoculture agriculture to grow flowers um you know that there's maybe it would be successful financially more but it wouldn't actually be as beautiful and as biodiverse as what is currently happening so just you know find your local flower farmer there's an organization called flower farmers of ireland they have a website you can find people local to you who will sell flowers and also try to find people who are growing veg near you and support them as well because that's key to us having um having businesses that do what we would like to see happening to regenerate agriculture yeah 100% and I would say yeah and I even don't forget to mention yours Anna's is big, big sky flowers isn't that right? That's me yeah so um, I, I I sell flowers I grow locally um, in some local businesses in Mullingar but I also do lots of sustainable education so I'm trying to help people live you know beautiful rich tasty scented lives without actually having a negative effect on the mother nature's earth yeah yeah so yeah an amazing biodiversity ambassador Thank <laughs> to you. have because, yeah and, well you de you definitely are and like what you're doing is so important because there's you know there's there's we need people to speak about every aspect from the bees to the trees to you know it's all the different things and that idea of the locally grown because it is there is a gap between what you know how humans treat nature in terms of the services that it provides us and then having things completely wild and I think you're in this lovely position in that middle point to really help educate people that look how beautiful our local flowers are and I could totally vouch for that I've I've seen um some of your bouquets and they're just they're more exquisite than anything anyone you. could buy in a shop so I would totally second that that all the local farmers and local growers um and and, and you know you all need to be supported because it's they're they're pure magic they're not staged they're beautiful they're they're just yeah it's it's really important so thank you so much again and um yeah please come back and um you could follow anna on i'm going to put down her link down here big sky flowers and um and again all the work she does in mullingar anything else you'd like to say before we say goodbye no, thanks for thanks for the opportunity to chat to people it's been great um you know you're doing great work in leading this charge and trying to to build awareness across the country so really appreciate being part of such a nice group yeah well th we enjoy having you too so thanks so much and again uh, thanks everyone for joining tea table talk